Hello, everybody. This is Charlene Bollinger with The Truth About Cancer and The Truth About Vaccines. And we are doing a series on The Truth About Vaccines and censorship and COVID, the vaccine, and all the information around that. And today, I have a very special guest. I'm honored to introduce to you Dr. Zach Bush. And he is a triple board certified physician and recognized educator on the intersection of the microbiome human health and disease, and our food production. Zach, I was really impressed with your knowledge and understanding of uh, the coronavirus, COVID-19, and what it is and what it is not, and what is happening in our environment to create the perfect storm in the body. And you brought three solid solutions. So I'm so excited to bring all of that to our audience. So can you please start by just explaining to us what is coronavirus what is this COVID 19. yeah so coronavirus is not a new thing obviously uh, we can track coronavirus in the genome back uh, some people think 700 years but it, uh, there's pretty good data showing that we've got 1200 years ago uh, human you know demonstration of co coronavirus in our experience. Uh, viruses are very simple genetic information updates uh, that are put out by nature uh, into the environment all the time. You know, there's you know, never a second that's going by where we don't have millions of, if not trillions of new variants of viruses that are being produced by nature. And they can be produced by bacteria, fungi, uh, human cells, certainly any mammal you know, any animal you can think of, as well as any bacteria or fungi you can think of is producing this genetic transport of information all the time. So viruses are not actually germs, like the, the germ theory that we have around bacteria is much different in function because bacteria are actually living things. Uh, vi viruses are just little pockets of genetic information that were developed really at the beginning of biology on the planet um, they were really the first steps towards uh, biology being able to function uh, within diverse ecosystems. And they have been the method for adaptation on the planet since the very beginning of biology. So we really have mistaken uh, the uh, application of our understanding of bacteria and, and fungi and living organisms like protozoa and parasites, and then applied them to viruses as if they were some sort of living organism that was capable of you know, life or overwhelm or attack on our bodies. And in fact, they're not at all capable of doing much of anything other than providing genetic information to the environment. And that can be the environment within our bodies or to the greater environment around us. But there's so few genes within a virus that uh, we can't prescribe like the breakdown of human health uh, in any condition to a virus alone. It has to be a more complex disruption of biology to lead to any symptoms. And of course, even in medical school, we're, set, we're told, you know, the common cold or flu, uh, the symptoms that we associate with that aren't from the virus, it's from our immune system's response to repair or change in the body. And so uh, viruses aren't per se damaging our cells even. It's not like the damaged cells that, that are lysed when viruses reproduce, that's not what needs cleanup. That's very few cells that will end up doing that per se. The ones that actually will invigorate an immune response are the intact cells that are now taking in that new genetic information and then placing uh, as they do. They put proteins on their surface to say, hey, this is what I'm making today. And then the immune system will go around and look at the situation. And if there's an overwhelming amount of signal from one place, it'll start to remove those cells through T cells and other guys to, to correct the balance or train of the environment. But the immune system is never like fighting against, uh, you know, a, a virus. Antibodies, if they, they, antibodies, I believe, play a very small role in the way in which we balance our relationship to, to viral information. Uh, we are engineered and the viruses are engineered as mechanisms of genetic transport to interact. We are supposed to be absorbing viral information and integrating that, filtering that information, rejecting what we don't need and taking in what we do need. So that's the mechanism of the, the surface proteins around a virus. When I produ produce viral information, I coat that virus in my own cell membranes covered with receptors and information to target them towards another uh, host. And I'm sending out my genetic information to update the environment around me really. And we do this all the time every day. We do it with large strands of RNA and DNA 
uh, that we think of as viral. And we also do it with something called microRNA, which are tiny little particles that are the, the switches on genes to make them behave differently. And so I'm exuding information out into my space every time I talk or every time I, you know, sweat, you know, that my urine stool, all of it's exuding this micro information out into the, into the environment. So we have this really, you know, beautiful dance of genetics around the planet since the beginning of time. And so it's really erroneous for us over the last, you know, 50 years, hundred years to really place all of this, you know, suspicion and, and uh, mal, mal, kind of maleficent, you know, belief system around these viruses because they're not even alive. They, they can't produce energy. They can't reproduce. They're just genetic updates to our system. And uh, if your body is not, you know, ready for genetic adaptation and shift, and there's a lot of toxicity in the body, you don't have, you have a poor antioxidant reservoir, then you can start to develop symptoms of, of real necessity for repair. But even that's not a bad thing. When you get a flu, and you suddenly spike a fever to 102 degrees, we know that that has really important implications for things like you know, precancerous cells in the body, detoxification, upregulating the immune system's kind of cleanup system of macrophage. So I believe that fever is a very important adaptation in, in our survival as a species, as well as, a, you know, as mammals as a whole, that illness is actually a gift. The sickness is actually a mechanism by which we can can clean up the body's kind of slow decay of, of genetic information or slow you know toxification from our environment and so we need to rethink not just our concept of viruses but rethink our concept of sickness and realize the body's always doing the right thing and if the body's got a fever and feels fatigued and malaise and brain fog it's because it's trying to clean stuff up and if we keep blaming the microbiome or the virome for these things then we're not we're never going to get at the root cause of the problem which is we're in a toxic stew and so this this current pandemic that we have is a, a perfect example of uh this situation and we can really you know work to understand not just this virus but all viruses through our current experience and i you know i hope to help you you and your audience today really understand what are the exact mechanisms that we know about covid and uh coronaviruses as a whole and then what are the mechanisms of the environmental stressors that are actually, you know, creating the symptoms and, and actual death from, from our current situation? Wow, that's uh, quite a really well-spoken and brilliant explanation of a virus and the way that the body works. Um, it's not the, the germs per se. We don't have to walk around with the mask on and washing our hands, although those are the, the washing of the hands is probably a good thing, especially with our kids when they go outside and they go in the horse pen, for example. But with this, this virus, it's, I'm seeing masks and I don't want to get into that yet, but the, what you said about the mask was brilliant. So we can talk about that with the solution, but understanding the concept of a virus, the COVID specifically, the way that, that uh, we're treating it conventionally right now and the understanding we see out there, the mainstream, talking points, we're seeing the ventilators and we're seeing vitamin C right out of the gate, which we know vitamin C is really uh, a great tool for health. But in the case of COVID, uh, right out of the gate, that's, that's probably not the best idea immediately down the line it will be. But your, your explanation earlier was really eye-opening to me and, and the science behind it made sense. So the COVID, you mentioned... Uh, there are a few conditions which caused what shouldn't be a big deal to be a big deal. Uh, uh, the COVID virus coupled with the pollution as well as the Roundup, which we see in Wuhan. Yeah. Causes yeah, so I think we severity. can get at kind of how did the, why do we have this virus expressed right now from nature? Yeah. So since, since the microbiome and, you know, multicellular organisms like humans are exuding this information, of you know genomic shift and adaptation all the time. What's what's forcing the adaptation? And um, you know we've got 30 years of science now showing that we are in a massive ecologic collapse on the on the planet. We are seeing massive climate change. We're seeing massive uh, transitions of of soil and ocean health uh, as we start to lose biology in every single sector, uh, from soil, water to air environments. And so in 
that is being driven by a human belief that we are at war with the microbiome. We still think that we have to kill all the bacteria. We still think that strep throat is the result of too many strep molecules. That's, strep bacteria doesn't cause strep throat. It's an adaptation, you know, screw up of the train that causes the, the overgrowth of, of a single species. It's the same thing that we do to a garden. When you go out in a diverse, you know, backyard system and then take a rototiller and till up all of the earth, the first things that are gonna come up are weeds because the weeds are adapted to do rapid recovery of a damaged ecosystem. If we go and spray the weeds, then the ecosystem doesn't recover. And then now we don't have good life. And so now we have to put artificial nutrients and herbicides, pesticides, because we have weak plants coming up. This is what we've done to the human body is we have surrounded it with antibiotics for the last 50 years. Uh, you know, the, the average, you know, American is now exposed, you know, to, uh, you know, at least one course of antibiotics in a year. But, you know, there's, there's an extraordinary burden of, of antibiotic usage uh, in our physician clinics, but it pales in comparison to the amount of antibiotics showing up in our meat, poultry, and in our crops. And that, of course, started with genetic modification for Roundup Ready crops um, in 1996. But that was pre-led pre by our use of Roundup as a desiccant or drying agent on wheat, which started in 1992. And so we started a full-out military blitz on the microbiome in the 1990s. And we have had a collapse of human health since then. We've obviously had an explosion of obesity rights starting then explosion of gluten sensitivity and celiac disease. And our lab has shown the relationship between Roundup microbiome and, and those conditions as you develop leaky gut. Uh, then you've got, you know, this massive, you know, decimation of uh, the soil nutrient delivery, which then leads to a, a collapse of the, the medicinals of our plants. And so not only are we lacking microbiome, our plants no longer have the medicine to treat the diseases that we would get as we lose the soil of our biology, which is our gut. And so we have you know, decimated the garden, if you will. We have really done a huge toll. And by the 2000s, we see increasing brain tumors, leukemias, lymphomas in children and adults. We see an explosion of uh, Alzheimer's in women, Parkinson's in men, ALS, MS, uh, autism, attention deficit, every neurologic condition we've ever described has started going up since then. So we're showing this devastating undermining of human biology starting in those, in those 1990s in a, a kind of renewed sense. And when I say that we've channeled chemical warfare at this, it literally is that because previous to 1976 or 74, I guess it was, uh, the, before we kind of repatented glyphosate as, as a weed killer and all this, uh, the, organophosphates were used in war. And so uh, back as far as the Korea War, but certainly getting into the 1950s and beyond with the Vietnam War, uh, we dumped an enormous amount of organophosphate into the Asian environment throughout North Vietnam and Cambodia. We, we literally moonscaped that entire jungle system, killing you know hundreds of millions of trees, monkeys, lizards, butterflies. We, we devastated all of life so that we could better see the Ho Chi Minh Trail from the air so we could kill more people. And so that was the war mentality of the organophosphate chemical is we could dump it from the air and, and annihilate jungle systems. So over the last couple of years, you know, we've been working on really demonstrating in the United States the exact patterns of Roundup spraying and its damage to the microbiome of the soils. And then subsequently, it's a water soluble molecule goes into our river systems kills rivers, and we have the biggest you know, ocean dead zone in the world right at the end of the Mississippi River. The dead zone, no fish, larger than the state of Rhode Island now, and the threatened zone around that, larger than the state of Texas. We put millions of dollars of fisheries out of business and everything else because there's literally no fish left in the dead zone. So we've so toxified the microbiology and, and life within those structures. So a couple of years ago, I started turning my attention to China for the reason that China is now producing way more glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup, than any other chemical company in the world. So we started, you know, as that chemical came off patent in 2007, we really saw an epidemic of, you know, farm and agricultural abuse of this chemical because it got so cheap coming out of China. And uh, China is now the, the highest spraying region in the whole world. And the bulk of that uh, spraying in China focuses into the central China right around Hubei province. Wuhan sits right in the middle of, of Hubei, essentially. And so you're in now central China. 
and the toxicity in the soils have reached a level where I know the microbiome has to be putting out stress signal at an extreme rate. Like we have to be sending out, you know, massive adaptation signals, massive, you know, genomic, you know, shift so that life can survive in Wuhan. So I've been t saying that there's going to be an epidemic of some virus coming out because the genetic stress is there. When we absorb this genomic information halfway around the world, we're, we are getting a message of a stress signal from the other side of the planet. And so now we need the adaptation skills. It's, I believe, really moving across the world to tell people, get ready, there's something happening that is going to require an adaptation. So not only is coronavirus very real, I believe it's very important. Like this is a critical piece of biologic adaptation that, that we need. And this is not the first time we've seen a coronavirus come out of this exact area of China. Of course, in 2002, we saw SARS and it was another coronavirus that created the exact same syndrome, which we'll come back to later as to, to how patients present with this because it's very important to point out that it's not a viral infection that we present with. If we're gonna become critically ill and potentially die, we are presenting with symptoms that don't have anything to do with an infection. Uh, some great studies coming out of New York City showing that. So, but before we even get to like the human experience of taking on this, this information, we need to, to really look a little bit deeper as to what's going on specifically in Wuhan. Why Wuhan? We've been told, well, there's some like open animal market in the middle of China. Well, th there's open animal markets all over Asia. Like it's, there's nothing remarkable about having an open animal marketplace. Uh, many people, you know, I think who are in the food safety industry would say that it's much safer to have, you know, a, a natural, you know, open air market than it is to have styrofoam plastic wrap pieces of beef that were packaged in factories with hundreds of thousands of cattle being slaughtered every month, as we have in the United States. And we recalled 18 million pounds of, of beef last year from toxic E. coli and the rest. So I would argue we have a more toxic, you know, food system and food delivery system than any, you know, you know, open marketplace, peasant farmers, they all are doing it cleaner than we are. We have the most, you know, chemicalized, most damaged food system in the United States. And so we need to not damn the Chinese people for a slightly more, you know, populous approach to food distribution. They're doing it better than we are. They have much better food security than we do in the United States. It's a whole nother topic, I guess. But the point being, it's not likely that suddenly this one animal market in the middle of all of Asia, which has the largest population of, you know, you look at all of Asia, a couple billion people, it's not like these markets are causing anybody any illness. It's, these markets are a natural part of the environment. What's not a natural part of the environment is actually the protein industry in Wuhan. And so they outsourced or, or took on rather um, the, the Western world's approach to chicken and, uh, and pork production, where they're doing it in enclosed environments where they uh, are forcing enormous amount of antibiotics into the feed of chickens and swine to try to keep them alive in these very toxic stews of environment. The pigs are now so buried in antibiotic, you can imagine what's happening in their stool. Their stool in the United States, like in North Carolina with Smithfield and all this, is now deemed uh, a, a uh, a biohazard and it's illegal to transport that across state lines. So in North Carolina and in Wuhan and the like, we have to build these huge levees where we store billions of gallons of pig stool that is stewing in these pots of antimicrobial stress. And out of that is coming a virome that's you know hard to imagine. You know, every bacteria capable of producing new viral information, now you multiply that by quadrillions and then put that into lakes of stool that are too big to measure, you can imagine the generation. Now, it turns out that if you overlap the maps of glyphosate spraying on crops with protein production, Wuhan and, and Hubei province are the epicenter. Then there has to be one more really potent mechanism uh, needed to create a pandemic, which is transport uh, of the virus through the air effectively. And it turns out that long evidence has shown that influenza and SARS and, you know, the coronavirus there, as well as the coronavirus that we see today, is all capable of binding to air pollution. And air pollution uh, in China is focused out of Beijing and it gets pressed down by the air currents coming down from the north, Beijing being just north of Hubei. Now you can start to see a situation where you have the most toxic agriculture, the most toxic protein production, and carbon particulate in the air that can bind those viruses and carry them very long distances. 
And so we have the perfect opportunity. So the last couple of years I've been saying we are at risk of creating a massive, you know, viromic shift. And I don't think the viruses are to blame here at all. They're, there's, they are, have no, they're only trying to help, you know, keep biology up to date. They are the genetic transport, you know, communication network. So it was not out of fear of the virus. It was out of fear of collapse of the planet that I've been saying, watch out because we've got to get ready for, you know, either a devastating shift in the, in the microbiome coming out of Hube, or we could take some proactive steps and stop spraying so much, change the protein industry and create a healthy food system for China. And then we're going to see a drop in all of this, you know, genetic adaptation that's been necessary for the biome over the last 30 years. And so um, that's what I've been preaching. I didn't have any idea it was going to come out so soon. I thought we were a few years away from maybe the next one because the pathway for coronavirus is typically kind of every 10 years, 2002, 2012. So I had been telling people maybe, you know, 20, 2022, somewhere in there, we'd be at risk for our next kind of shift to happen. But, it, you know, as we know, the, the, the degradation of the planet is accelerating. And so now it's been, you know, a seven or eight year gap from our last resolution of uh, a coronavirus shift, but we've got a coronavirus shift. There's a new RNA protein uh, in, in this uh, new coronavirus strain. We haven't been able to figure out what that protein does exactly, but I have some theories that aren't even worth mentioning right now because they're not, not important to this conversation, but that RNA strain is interesting to me because I think it's going to reveal something about the new stress that we're putting on the microbiome of China through outsourcing all of our chemical industry there. Um, so now we have PM 2.5, I'll uh, describe that quickly. So carbon particulate in the air is a, a very potent predictor of death of all kinds. And so whether you're talking about lung cancer or infectious diseases or autoimmune diseases, they seem to correlate highly with the toxicity of, of small carbon particulate in the air. The term PM 2.5 just means particulate matter less than 2.5 microns in size. And so uh, to give you a sense of how big 2.5 microns is, uh, let's see, one micron it is uh, one, one thousandth of a millimeter. So if you can picture a millimeter on your ruler uh, and then picture a thousand of these little particles stacked up, that now you're at the, the particulate matter that's in the air. So too small to see, it, it's airborne, comes sucking right into our lungs, into our deepest air pockets very easily. And so PM 2.5 has been a massive problem for uh, you know, respiratory disease in China and everything else. They've made extraordinary efforts over the last few years to, to re, you know, clean up Beijing. But nonetheless, we see these extraordinary particulate levels in Wuhan that are about, you know, anywhere from 20 to 200 times higher than we see in New York City here. So massive amounts of air pollution. So now you've got a viral plume of stress coming out of the microbiome in China, binding to all of this PM 2.5 that goes up into the stratosphere and travels around the world. Viruses have been traveling the planet for eons uh, since the beginning of biology. And instead, now we have the CDC and other groups that, trying to paint us a picture that, oh, this airplane took off from here and there was a passenger on it that carried the virus over here as if somehow the virus is waiting for 4.2 billion years for humans to invent airplanes so they can move around the planet. Not how things work. It's just, that's not biologically true. And so what are they talking about? Are they just lying? No, they're, they're not lying. They're just telling you a very small piece of the puzzle, which is respiratory droplets. So we know that viruses can be suspended in, in the liquid of a respiratory droplet, and it, and it can usually go about three feet from our body. And so we have this little cloud of respiratory around us that is one of the mechanisms by which we communicate. We communicate through hormones, pheromones, redox signaling molecules, you know, viral genomic information, exosomes, all this cool stuff. So we're like this cloud of genetic, genomic endocrine information that we walk around with. And with some of you, when you see somebody you love, you're recognizing them on a uh, hundred different levels, a thousand levels, millions of levels, because you're interacting with every cell in their body when you come into their presence. And that is a good thing. We know that the more community you have, the more people you connect to in a day, the healthier and longer you live. Every blue zone in the world has totally different diets, different it's climates, we've been trying to figure out why do people live over 100 years in these blue zones? And the answer came back uh, through the mathematical algorithms that it was simply the community. If people have strong multi-generational community and stay you know, connected to a big social group, they tend to be much healthier. A uh, cool study was done recently looking at flu and uh, the symptoms of that. And it was showed that if people got more than seven hugs a day, they had a 35% reduction in uh, getting the flu. And I love that. It's just like, 
we've got the wrong model of, oh, we need to be afraid of each other. We're, we're, we're passing disease. No, we're actually passing genomic information for a stronger immune system. And if we have a strong immune system by our constant interaction, we are very resilient. In the United States, right. where we really crushed this thing down, we see the highest death tolls coming right out of New York, where nobody's walking on the streets and they're still climbing. And, you know, we're not changing things by isolation. We know that isolation causes a drop in immune system function. Well, that's so, brilliant. I just, I know you're, you've got so much to say, but I really want to dig into this social aspect and, and you're probably going to get there naturally, but I just wanted to, to say that Ty and I, when we watch the mainstream news, typically we'll say, well, whatever they tell us, we're going to believe the opposite. Right now, it's not the case. Right now, we've got the... Uh, coronavirus, everybody's afraid. They're saying, stay home, don't go anywhere, wear a mask and don't touch anyone. And even in your own home, the World Health Organization is telling us, if there's somebody in your house that has this coronavirus, guess what? We're just gonna come in and take them out in a dignified manner and you know, isolate them for 14 days. Now we've got the HR 6666, what in the world is that? Uh, the number alone is scary to everybody. But that when you read the, the act, it's, or the, the bill that they're proposing, it's, um, it's really just a, a reiteration of what the WHO just said. And it happened really quick. They said it at the World Health Organization. Now they're saying it here. And I've heard uh, legislators get up on a podium saying, if someone in your home is sick, we, we're just going to come in there. And you know, even if you don't think you're sick, we're going to take your temperature. And if you have a cough, we're just going to take you out of the home. And you know, isolate you for 14 days. So this, this concept that they can come into our home is, is really a breach of our liberties and our freedoms, number one. But number two, and I think it's equal to the number one, what you're saying, Zach, is that when we are not spending time together in community, socializing, hugging each other, one thing, one common thread with everything that Ty and I have um, researched, and especially when we did the, the Eastern Medicine addition to our films, we went there and all of the Asian doctors said across the board that treating cancer is more than just the tumor or the, the little part. It's the holistic approach. But in every case, they found something mentally attached to that manifestation of disease in the body, which we've seen studies showing us that anger or fear or these other detrimental emotions are causing physical manifestations of sicknesses and like you said the flu or whatever it is because your your immune system becomes compromised and you can't really fight that illness as effectively when you're dealing with such stress or fear or anger or so forth but you know the bible says a uh, cheerful heart is good medicine and we see that you, literally if you have a good hearty laugh that boosts your immune system for up to 24 hours from what we've seen in the studies as i go through this next bit of information it'd be you know good if everybody kind of keeps in mind of you know social distancing masks everything else like if we are to believe that this is a deadly virus passing around then these things make sense on some level even though they don't have any real scientific testing or, or validation at least they 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 kind of pass the sniff tip okay there's some virus that passes from human to human, which already we've mentioned that it actually passes through the air uh, without human droplets. But nonetheless, if, if that paradigm is, is it, then the messages that we're getting kind of make some sort of sense. But when we back up and realize there is no virus that has all of the complex mechanisms that it would take to cause, you know, the, the death that we see through uh, the syndrome that's been described in the hospitals, um, we have to like back up and say, well, what are they dying from then? If, if a virus isn't enough to do this, then why? And if most people who get COVID are either not even aware they ever were sick or have a mild, you know, kind of a couple days of fatigue, headache, and then it's gone. It, what, if most people are having that virus and it's a completely benign experience, then there must not be something in the virus itself that is capable of inducing death. It must be part of a much more complex thing. So that was you know, the obvious effort that I went into at the beginning of this was to start to understand, all right, how is the patient presenting who's, who's really going to die from this condition? And we knew almost immediately that it was hypoxia. And so th this is not new. We saw this with the last, you know, situation with SARS in, in 2002. People would turn blue. And then in the description of the SARS from one of the, the guys on the front line in China, they say, patients show up blue and then they have to wait 
until their lungs eventually flu fill with fluid, and then they die of subsequent organ failure and pneumonias. That presentation is very important because the lungs is where we think of the injury being of like, oh, we've got this you know, huge respiratory failure going on, therefore they can't breathe, therefore they're blue. But if you've ever seen with somebody with pneumonia, you realize they never present blue. They actually usually present vasodilated. They look like they just ran a race. You know, they're a little pink in the face. They're working really hard. They're breathing really hard. They're you're fight, fighting for every breath. But these patients are actually quite relaxed. They they're comfortable. They're not. Their respiratory rate might be slightly elevated, but they're not having any time difficulty exchanging air in their lung or anything like that. But they're blue. So this was described with the last coronavirus, which is very important again, because there's been some conspiracy theories around, maybe it's just 5G radiation, there's no virus and all this. Now, we have seen this long before 3G, let alone 5G. This is an old pattern. And so we should have you know, figured it out in 2002, but we didn't as physicians and scientists because we had been told there was this horrible virus called, called SARS. And we had just, in our fear paradigm, I think failed to ask the deeper question of, does that even make sense? Today, we're getting you know, great data that we need to look at carefully because we're very big risk of this thing being over the next couple of weeks, and we don't go and learn what we were supposed to learn again, and we go and face this thing another eight years or another 20 years, and so or another three years at the current pace that we're going. So we have to learn from our patients, and, and when I left the university in 2010, after 17 years in academic environments, I started learning better than I ever had because it was just me and my patients in rural Virginia in, a, in an impoverished little town of 550 people. And I was the doc. I, I saw everything. I was stitching people up. I was, you know, I saw their colds, flus. I saw their cancers. I saw their substance abuse, their familial abuse, sexual trauma. I saw it all. And, and what I learned in that space was that being a physician is about sitting and listening again. And I got to be a better diagnostician than I ever had in the universities because I was looking at my patients. I was listening to their story. And their story is a perfect biologic assay to show us exactly what's happening. I don't need a CT scan or even blood work anymore to know over the last 20 years, how did this patient get to be in my exam room with this constellation of symptoms? Because I listened for a long time. Over two, year, two hours of listening, you will put the patient's whole life together. You'll actually know why they're in the abusive relationship there. And you'll actually know why they, their child left home and did drugs. You'll figure all of that out by listening rather than doing a bunch of busy, fancy tests. And so we need to take that discipline of real human intuition, human quantum physics, quantum computing capacity that we have, and apply that to the story that's coming out of this situation. So let's do that for a moment. So a patient shows up blue. Before you do, I just want to say this, Zach. We need more doctors like you, OK? We, we've met a lot of doctors. doctors all over the place. Well, we do, but we need, we need more of them. So I'm sorry. I just wanted to say that and put it out there. Please continue. <laughs> well, bacteria are good at cloning. So, so I might just like bleb <laughs> off and turn into a thousand little, little country doctors pretty soon. Okay. But, um, right. <laughs> um, but, you know, so you, when I started looking at this, you know, the reports coming out of China and everything else, it was like, oh, wait, this is, this is not pneumonia at all. And other people were saying, not just me. And so then I just kind of started going down the simple process of, right, I'm going to start listening to these patients and starting to look at the public health patterns. It told me the bigger story. Okay. Why Wuhan? Well, I knew why Wuhan. I've been talking about that for years. Okay. So there's huge microbiome stress. This thing comes out. We know PM 2.5 is there. So where's PM 2.5 going to travel? Again, this is air pollution. So it's going to travel across uh, the oceans and going to hit very predictable pathways. Now you can have respiratory droplet passage of virus too, and that's gonna give you some erratic kind of you know, conditions that might not just follow the air current. So it's gonna start popping up all over the world, um, but it's not gonna be linear. It's not like it passed from patient one to patient five like they want you to think. This thing is dispersing through all kinds of mechanisms of biology and air currents and, and ecology. A nice study coming out of Europe a couple of years ago showed that viruses were showing up in ice caps and in deserts at the same pattern across the world as they were showing up in humans to suggest that it doesn't take human presence to move viruses around. They, they move through the air currents and everything else. So respiratory drops, droplets go about three feet, but airborne particulate viruses that are you know, tagged to a piece of dust or pollen or some other tiny carbon uh, molecule that you would find in, in the carbon waste from transportation or energy systems is going to carry it very far, thousands of miles, maybe all the way around the world a couple of times before that thing 
is is neutralized. So I think these viruses can persist very, very long in, in nature. The fact that we can find them in ice caps and all of this stuff would suggest that they're far more stable. So why do we say that the virus only lasts for three days? Well, that's true uh, if it's in a respiratory droplet. Uh, water is the most potent detergent on the planet. If you, if you drop a Navy ship that weighs you know, thousands of tons of steel into the bottom of the ocean, it's going to be gone over the next few decades because the water will completely absorb all of that mass of steel. And so water is a detergent. It literally is here on the planet to, to be the ultimate you know, final say in recycling of, of energy and materials around the planet. So when you put a virus in a droplet of water, it's going to have an oxidative effect on that virus and it's going to break it down faster. If you have a, a, an airborne virus that has a, a protein shield that doesn't require water to maintain the protein structure, but then gets carried by you know, air currents and, and you know, is umbrellaed across the world on dust or smoke particles and all of this, we're, we're going to get uh, coverage around the planet very quickly. So that was happening you know, starting back you know, probably November or something like that. Our first you know, descriptions were coming out at the end of December by China, but it's pretty clear that, you know, that, again, there was no patient zero. They've made it clear there is no patient zero in China. Uh, the, the, even the epidemiologists haven't been able to track it all the way back because they're now realizing things were coming out. So the viruses are always present far before we as physicians suddenly realize this it doesn't look like a typical pneumonia. So you can imagine how many flus, colds, fevers, everything else was happening in October, November, December before somebody finally said, hold on a second, this, this critically ill patient turning blue, this reminds me of SARS. And that's what happened with Dr. Wu in China is he had actually been on the front lines with, with SARS and he, he recognized the pattern. He's like, I haven't seen this in 18 years, but this looks like SARS. I'm afraid we have a new coronavirus out there. And he ended up being spot on and, and the Chinese government, you know, he died uh, of complications of, of some condition uh, a couple weeks later, or I guess maybe a month and a half or something. But now he's been, you know, deemed the highest medal of honor in China, the, the Martyr Award um, for his recognition of this condition. Thank you so much for joining us, for bringing clarity to the table and helping us to understand these masks are no good. We've heard Fauci even say that the masks are not helpful. They're not helping. They're actually harming. Uh, the Surgeon General came out and said these masks are not good, yet you can't go to Trader Joe's unless you wear a mask. And so there's such a massive disconnect. And all the while we are being censored. Our voice is being censored. The truth is being censored. So the ones that control the media, the ones that control uh, the different high-end systems, whether some of the governors that we see are acting tyrannical, they're keeping the truth from the people that leads to life. There are governors that won't let people out of their house that say you don't, you can't go out of your house. Then we've got Sheriff Mack, the constitutional sheriff who's helping other sheriffs to understand the constitution and their duty to the constitution. So um, we're working with him to bring awareness to that and help other sheriffs to understand and policemen to understand that it is not their job to lock us up and to take mothers away from children because they're wearing a sign in protest to this tyranny. It's their job to support that mother's right and certainly not separate that mother from the child. Uh, that's a video, one of the videos and many videos that have gone viral. So there's a lot going on around us, but you help us to bring sense to what is the COVID, what is the cause and what is the treatment and that mask is not good for us. Thank you, Dr. Zach, for joining us. It's been enlightening, encouraging, and I'm filled with hope. Thank you. And thank you out there for joining us. God bless you, and until next time, we'll see you soon.